Anyone who honestly pursues answers to the origin and meaning of life is at risk of having a very real encounter with the God who created all things. And I think Joe Rogan is dangerously close to having that encounter. I think he's genuinely curious about God and the origins of the cosmos. And so he's interviewing Stephen Meyer, who is kind of a normie Christian guy. I mean, he's a philosopher of science. He's obviously very smart. And I think that this shows not only that Joe is curious about these things, but that there's a whole community of people out there who are not buying in to the modern secular explanations for why we're here and what it all means. First of all, thank you for being here. Appreciate it. It is great to be here, Joe. Thanks for having I've, me. I've really enjoyed uh, watching some of your videos online and, and listening to these arguments. This this idea of intelligent design, my question to you, like right off the bat, was is this an idea that you did you have a pre did you have a notion in your mind already that you were trying to prove? Or was this something that you sort of started to believe upon the preponderance of evidence? Great question off the bat from Joe Rogan, because because you could you could see that what he's curious about. Is this are you ideologically committed? to this idea of intelligent design, or is this something that you encountered? And the caution there, I think, from Joe is like, you could convince yourself of anything if you try hard enough, right? You could really, you could really convince yourself that this is, this is the right thing because you want to believe that this is the right thing. And, um, and, and I do think theology is one of those things that encounters you when, when you're doing it honestly. I, I think that, yes, historically people have abused theology. In particular, people have abused religious ideas and religious systems to get what they want. And I think that's kind of the caution there behind Joe's question. And I think it's a good caution. Um, and so I and, – and I wonder too if, if Joe is like looking at Stephen and saying, you know – are, are you with me? Are you like me? Because are, are, I'm curious about these things, but I really don't want to get duped in <laughs> to <laughs> believing something that is hokey or weird or strange. I, I, I want to believe the truth. And uh, are, we, are we part of the same tribe? Are we on the same path? Or are you one of those religious people that I'm not going to be able to talk to? Obviously, he invited him on the podcast, so he thinks that there's – uh, a meaningful conversation to be had here, and so, um, yeah, I, I think that that I think that that initial question is great. And again, in the back of my mind, I keep thinking like the fact that Stephen Meyer, who is a who, who's a Christian, he's a philosopher of science, is on Joe Rogan. To me, really says that Joe Joe's kind of a dog with a bone here. He's he's curious about some stuff, and I wonder. I've wondered if the seeds of this interview here were planted back with the interview with uh, Adam Curry, where Adam Curry shared his experience uh, with Jesus. And so i um, curious about that. So It was more the latter, but I had, a by the time I first encountered it, a philosophical framework that made me open to it. Um, I had a long protracted uh, religious conversion from late high school all the way through college. It, took, it was the last thing from a Damascus Road experience. And uh, how did it happen? It was a process of philosophical deliberation. It was not really based on science initially. I started having weird existential questions when I was 14 years old after I'd broken my leg in a skiing accident. And these are not weird existential questions. Um, these are just que these are the questions that all people ask. This really is, I, I think. Um, so I don't know. Stephen is a very smart person, it has a tendency to to maybe be complex, and and one of my goals is because um, I, I I can do that like I kind of try to think about things and I overthink about things and I, I sort of like make them more complex in my mind. So one of my goals is to simplify theology, no, not simplify theology, but but I want to understand theology in a way that's not just like woo-woo, ethereal, and like, I, I feel like if God is really out there, and if God has made himself known, um, he, he's made himself known in a way that a, a four-year-old kid and an 84-year-old person 
could understand him. Um, and so normal people, you don't have to be a philosopher of religion to to come into contact with God. And so though Stephen kind of lives in that world, and he basically used a very philosophical answer, a very sort of like complex way of saying the answer to Joe's question is a bit of both. I, I, I was preconditioned to kind of believe Christianity, but that wasn't the main thing that drew me into Christianity. So I think what Stephen is saying is, yeah, I grew up in a Christian home, um, but my conversion to Christianity was a more genuine philosophical uh, experience or a genuine philosophical um, journey, maybe. Journey is the right word. The questions like, well, what's it going to matter in 100 years? Um, I, I was, there's this great quote from Bertrand Russell where he says, you know, that all the, the noonday genius of human achievement is destined for extinction in the vast heat death of the solar system. Whoa. I had, Again, that's, that's, com that's complicated. <laughs> Slow down. Slow down, Steve. I had never encountered Bertrand Russell as a 14-year-old, but I later encountered <laughs> that quote, and I thought, that was what was bothering me, you know. That I, dude was a scorcher. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, you know, I read... In the hospital after I had this accident, I was reading a, a book about the history of baseball, and I was totally into baseball at the time. I couldn't think of a, a, a better, a, a higher form of human achievement than to play for the New York Yankees. Mm. And yet all the stories of the great baseball guys ended the same. You know, they, they were recruited by uh, scouts who saw their talent. They came up to the big leagues. They uh, 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 amassed records. They won a certain number of World Series. And then, you know, if they were really great, uh, they go to the Hall of Fame and retire at 38. And then what? And then I got to thinking, well, but then what for any of us? You know, and and so I was I was this this question of of uh, of meaning kind of haunted me. What 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 could I possibly do that would have any lasting or enduring meaning? And um, I ended up taking I, I did a physics major and a geology. So his quest for meaning leads him to physics. I, I, and, and I think, again, this is everyone's, everyone has this. Everyone has this same quest. And I think that Stephen being on Joe Rogan is it, like a barometer. It's like we're taking the temperature of our, our society today. Joe Rogan has one of the biggest, if not the biggest podcast in the world. I've said this before, but Socrates said, you know, to understand what's going on in the soul of humanity, we have to look at the city because the city kind of allows us to zoom in to the soul of humanity. I wonder if like the internet in a way does that for us today, maybe even in a, in a grander scale. And so in a way, I think the things that happen on Joe Rogan and some of these other like mega podcasts are a bit of a barometer to where people are. And I do think that People are seeing that the modern secular answers to meaning, origin, purpose, destiny are not sufficient to explain our experience with reality. They're just not sufficient. So they're looking for something else. That's why Stephen Meyer ends up on Joe Rogan's podcast, I think. And so, yeah, so I, you know, again, his quest for meaning leads him into becoming a physicist or whatever. Everybody else's quest for meaning leads them uh, maybe somewhere else. I don't know. Where Where has your quest for meaning led you? What books have you read? What people have you interacted with? Who, who draws you in? That kind of thing. What communities have you found yourself in, whether it be Christian, whether it be um, some, some other religious group or, or, or nothing at all? Maybe it's a online gaming community, you know, or something like that, which, you know, so where has your quest for meaning led you? major uh, in college, but I took as many philosophy classes as I could along the way, and I encountered these existentialist writers who were asking these same types of questions and realized, oh, uh, as a 14-year-old, I thought I must be insane to be having these questions, and I worried that I was insane. I was a real, I mean, it was a, it was a real funk I was in for six or eight months, uh, and then later I realized, no, these were philosophical questions, and for me, uh, the religious conversion I had started to address and answer those questions, so I was I was by the time I got out of college, I was a convinced theist for philosophical reasons, but it, but I had at that point I was completely comfortable with the evolutionary explanation of everything, and then at a conference in my uh, that I attended um, while I was working as a geophysicist, uh, it was a conference about the origin of the universe, the origin of life, and the origin and nature of human consciousness, and it was divided on each panel between 
theists and philosophical materialists who were debating these, these big questions at the intersection of science and philosophy. And I was kind of stunned to learn or to, to perceive at least that the theists seemed to have the intellectual initiative in each of these big discussions, that materialism was a philosophy that was a spent force. It was not explaining where life first came from or the universe came from, let alone consciousness. Yeah. That, I think, is that's a profound observation. Um, not only the material world that we're looking for answers for, like, how, how did a, you know, fish, you know, um, come to be or something like that. It's a dumb example, but... But, but not just like in the simple things of where did a fish come from, but where, then where did human consciousness come from? And this is something that Jay Richards and Guillermo Gonzalez worked out in their book, The Privileged Planet. The, 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 the conditions necessary for life to exist on Earth are the same conditions necessary for observation to take place. So the conditions that some people materialists would say evolved uh, the conditions presuppose intelligent observers and there's no way you can explain that through an evolutionary process it has to be designed in the system because the natural world functions assuming that consciousness exists and that is just something that i you have to invoke god in order to explain that. i don't know how else you would explain that so that's profound and I think that's one of the that's one of the things that is causing materialism or modern secularism to really wobble. This is my this is my testimony. I, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I um, I was an atheist, and and my conversion starts with a deconversion to atheism. Like I just realized that the questions I was asking could not be answered if I began from a atheistic framework. I just, it just, questions like love and meaning and these questions, just, they, we needed something um, with more explanatory power than just time plus matter plus some unguided process. And so I began, in a sense, on a kind of intellectual journey to see where these new evidences, the evidence for the beginning of the universe or the fine-tuning of the universe, or the, the thing that really intrigued me was the discovery that at the foundation of life and even the very simplest cells, we have this amazingly complex code. That DNA, we all learned about in high school, we think that, you know, we all learned about the double helix structure of the DNA molecule, but that's not the most important thing about it. It's that within that double helix, there is literally a code, uh, a digital information that is directing the construction of the important proteins and protein machines that every, cells, every cell needs to stay alive. Bill Gates has said it's like a software program, but much more complex than any we've ever created. And I was doing, at the time, uh, for the, the work as a geophysicist for an oil company, I was doing uh, uh, seismic digital signal processing, which was an early form of information technology. And I got fascinated with the idea that, that there was this, first of all, an impasse in evolutionary explanations of the origin of life. Nobody how we got, knew how we got from the chemistry in the prebiotic soup to the code in an actual living cell. Yeah. This is, um, this is key. You know, again, we sort of find ourselves needing a better explanation. And I don't think it is um, inconsequential that Scripture... Now, I, and I come at this from an atheist from an atheist. I come at this from a biblical Christian worldview uh, as best as I can. I try to represent that worldview. Uh, I'm a work in progress, but the code that exists, there is language that exists in the DNA structure. It, it, there's language everywhere. We look at this world and we make an honest observation. We see language is the foundation for that life to exist. And it's not without consequence that Scripture, the Bible, has been saying this since the beginning. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him. And apart from Him, uh, nothing came into being. This period isn't there in the original Greek. I feel like it makes this... English translation, the English rendition of this a little bit clunky. Uh, nothing came into being. That which has come into being in him was life. 
That, that, that's another way of reading this, and that life was the light of men. So life and light connected to the Word, who is the person of God. That's Jesus, Jesus incarnate, but God is an infinite personal God according to the Bible. So if you have an infinite personal God, seeing language in creation makes sense. It's, it's consistent with that worldview. I mean, you can go to Genesis chapter 1, uh, and it's the same thing. In the beginning, God said, Genesis 1, 3, then God said, let there be light, and there was light. Okay, so, you know, again, we're, it, it's, it's amazing to realize just how much the Bible has gotten right from the beginning, and that people dismiss the Bible as some sort of hokey religious text created by a bunch of white-bearded old men in like the 4th century or something, 400 AD or whatever, um, and which isn't the case, which the Bible has testified to that over and over again, and it's testimonies like this, that, that we dismiss it, we try to, we dismiss the Bible, we try to work out the answers for ourselves, and after we come full circle, we've just recreated a human version of what the Bible has already been saying, I think. That's why simulation theory has uh, become kind of popular today. Uh, but it was fascinating that the, the impasse was created by the mystery surrounding the origin of information. Where did that come from? And so uh, a year later, I was off to, to uh, grad school in England. I ended up doing a PhD in origin of life biology within a uh, history and philosophy of science d uh, department in, in Cambridge. And um, so that's kind of my a sketch of my journey and how I got interested in this. I saw in one of your previous interviews, you said that you were very interested in origin stories. And yeah. Me too. You know, that was the... Well, it's always interesting when you see someone who's kind of dedicated their life to a very specific thing. Like, where, what's the root of this? Where did it come from? So for you, you, you went through this funk, and did you find comfort in religion? Is, th is that what helped you? What? Did you find structure in it? I found answers to basic worldview questions that I thought were, as a 14-year-old, I thought nobody, you know, there must be something wrong with me. Nobody else is having these questions. I'm not talking to anyone at school who's worried about I me. think you're just smart. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, and I wonder if, you know, again, I think these are just questions that people ask, but are they given the space to ask it in a kind of modern education system or our modern culture. I, I had a similar experience uh, as a young person. I had all of these questions, but my mom encouraged them. Shout out to my mom, who really is one of the people who taught me to think for myself. And so I would have all these questions and she would just be like, man, you have that, that's a great question. You know, you should ask more, you know, um, but I don't know, like that, that is, that's a sad testimony to me that, that Stephen Meyer felt like he was alone in a world of people who really do ask these questions. Uh, but maybe people are not given permission to ask those questions. And maybe some people, it's just they're not asking those questions at, at that age, maybe, that he was asking them. So it could be a little bit of just a, you know, he's a little early to these philosophical questions um, where everybody else is still trying to figure out how to, like, get through, um, you know, whatever the first rendition of Mario on the first Nintendo. That was my life, at least. <laughs> oh, it was. I remember one day, I mean, just uh, total... Re well, okay, for example, I was uh, in this big leg cast, and I would crutch my way up to the... To the uh, uh, up our driveway, get the newspaper, bring back the box scores to read, you know, about the baseball games the night before. And every day, it's a new date. And I do this, and a new date, and a new date. And I started thinking, time is a really freaky thing. I can imagine an event, and you know, I'm going to lift this cup, I'm going to drop it, put it over there. Now, that event just took place, but it's already gone. We're not experiencing it anymore. We have a memory of it. But what does that actually mean? Where did, There was this flow of sensory experience, but there didn't seem to be anything rooting it that gave it a, a, um, an enduring reality. And I had this sense there must be something that doesn't change or else everything else that does change um, is passing, ephemeral, and, and ultimately of no account. And so, you know, you read, I, I ended up reading the big fat family Bible that I'd never cracked and uh, found that when God revealed his name to Moses, it was the I am that I am, this timeless, eternal 
person. And you found the same thing in the New Testament, the way Jesus Christ was referred to. Was, uh, and so I thought, I, w- I wonder if there is something that doesn't change. And so it, the kind of philosophical questions that I was having made me want to explore whether or not a revealed religion might in fact be true. That's a really interesting way to come at the idea of God as the, the kind of the unmoved mover. Aristotle, you know, kind of ancient philosophers were trying to work this out in a very similar way. There, there, You have a series of cause and effect in this world. So how did we get to the present moment? Let's say if the cosmos is infinite, and I know that they will eventually talk about this, I think, in this podcast, but uh, you, you can't traverse that infinite causal space. You know, you can't, um, if the hole that you're trying to jump out of has no bottom, has no beginning, not only can you not jump out of it, you can't even start. You have no foundation to start with. So how do you get to the present moment if there's not some unmoved mover, uh, some, some, something outside of the cause and effect universe who does not move, is not bound to that cause and effect reality, but, but has the agency to move all things forward? That's a, that's a really kind of like, again, sort of complex philosophical way of coming at the question of, is there a God? <laughs> you know, it's like everything I see in life is moving around me. What did, where did it all begin? The way Jesus Christ was referred to. Was, uh, and so I thought, I, w- I wonder if there is something that doesn't change. And so it, the kind of philosophical questions that I was having made me want to explore whether or not a revealed religion might in fact be true. Can I ha- ask yeah. you to expand on that? What do you mean by th- something that does not change? Um some More. eternal self-existent reality, I guess. I, you know, it was not something as a 14-year-old I had worked out. It was a kind of an intuition that mm-hmm. there, um, all I, it was the experience of having uh, the, 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 the constant flux of changing sense perceptions left me with a sense that uh, there was nothing solid to, to hold on to in reality. And, um, and so this was, uh, this is not a great, you know, th- th- this is not the argument for the existence of God that I would re- repose, in-, in which I would repose great trust. I'm not trying to persuade anyone by this. I'm just telling what my experience was at this point. I later found what I think are very, very persuasive arguments, both philosophically and scientifically. The thing that really convinced me as a, as a university student doing uh, studying philosophy was the- an argument known as the-, the argument from epistemological necessity. So, y- I-, I don't know. You do kind of get the sense that, you know, Stephen is, he's not necessarily an apologist, really. So apologetics is um, the the kind of like, you could look at it as the study, the art of giving an answer, almost like debate, you know, dialogue. And I guess I don't know where I would put Stephen in that. He's not like a, um, like a Josh McDowell or... Um, or Sean McDowell, you know, who's like very, very specifically trying to be uh, do work in apologetics. Stephen is a philosopher of science, and and yet his books are kind of apologetic in nature. You know, he's giving a he's giving his case for why he believes in theism. And um, I love that he started to open up about his own personal story, but I I'm sad that he felt like that's not. Um, worth continuing you know like I want to hear more Um, he moves into kind of his shtick you know he's going to give you his reasons for why he believes in intelligent design why he believes in God and um, and I think the podcast format particularly Joe Rogan it it is dialogue he he, you're not trying to persuade anyone you're just talking you're having a conversation um, and so I, I do feel sad that he kind of felt the need to s- sort of go, well, okay, this isn't super persuasive. These aren't really my airtight um, kind of kind of arguments. Um, and so he felt like maybe he couldn't pursue that that line of dialogue or conversation. Um, and I think that we can learn from that. I think that I don't know, my own experience in apologetics has been one. Um, let me let me do this really quick. My own my own experience with apologetics has been one where I see that it can be very good, like like equipping Christian believers to 
understand why they believe what they believe. That is really important. This is important for anybody. You got to have reasons for why you believe what you believe. And the tendency, I think, within kind of modern evangelical Christianity is a lot of people just end up in, as Christians. It's like, I was born into it, you know, um, and I haven't really thought about it. I don't really know why I believe it. And it's like, well, and that's not helpful. That's not helping anybody. And it's not certainly not helping anybody really feel like the gospel is maybe even something worth pursuing if people just end up in it. Um, and so I've seen the good in apologetics. I've also, I've also encountered some of the negative side of apologetics, which is kind of this, which it's like it doesn't allow us to just have conversation. It doesn't allow us. It's like you got to move on to the argument. You got to you got to win people with this argument. And I don't think that's how apologetics should should be done. I I think that um, apologetics can, apologetics can be done very conversationally. And as a note for this channel, I have always shied away from doing any real apologetics on this channel. And again, apologetics, particularly with, and I'm speaking kind of within the Christian, um, in, you know, in-house kind of thing, like the Christian community. Um, there are a lot of other channels that do Christian apologetics well, do much better than I can. And so I've always kind of pumped the brakes of doing any real apologetics work on this channel. My interest is creating conversation about theology and seeing where that goes, because I'm fascinated by theology. I'm fascinated by the fact that um, I don't have to have my theology completely figured out in order to come to God or for God to come to me, which is more accurate. And that I will never end this pursuit. There is perpetual novelty when it comes to the area of theology. And I have learned a lot of theology. I've learned a lot about what I believe to be true about God outside of the Christian church, outside of the Christian community that I've been a part of and I love. And I've been a part of it for close to, gosh, I think 30 years now. No, that's not correct. 20-something years. I am so bad at math. <laughs> uh, yeah, like 24, 25 years. Like, um, and, and I've, uh, I do, I, that, that is a, that's a great community. It's not f full of perfect people. It's full of imperfect people. And so I've got my scars from being a part of the Christian community, but, but more and more, um, you you find that being a part of that anyway i'm i'm rambling about my experience with christianity but um there there's a lot of encouragement and there's a lot to be said for being a part of that christian community now is that the reason you form your theology no um but it is it is great to see that your ideas your theological ideas coincide with reality it's like oh i met this person jesus or i came into contact with this person jesus then I came into contact with other people who came into contact with Jesus, and I noticed that they were like Jesus. And that's encouraging to me. That is, that's not a philosophical, you know, argument for the existence of God or the, the um, uh, authenticity of Christianity or the person of Jesus or the Bible, but it's not nothing. That's, that's something, you know, um, so anyway, long diatribe coming to a conclusion here to say, um, if you are interested in more apologetic stuff, let me know. I don't mind going into that. I, I just think that there are other channels doing that and they're doing it well. And I can link some of those in the comments. I also don't want to invite all the trolls that come with those channels. I want to create a community here of people who maybe are Christian, maybe aren't Christian, but are interested in theology. And we're all kind of trying to point to that same goal of how do I understand God? How can I know God and be known by God? And this is my point about being a part of the Christian community is I have learned a lot from the Christian community, but I've also learned a lot from people outside of the Christian community. Um, and I think there's something to be said for that. So I always want I always want this channel to be outward facing, and I don't ever want it to be just sort of a Christian echo chamber. 
Um, although I, I am a, I'm a Christian person and I um, try to live my life from a biblical Christian worldview. So there you go. Rant over if you're still with me at this point. I love that you're here. And if you haven't subscribed yet, subscribe to this channel or share this with a friend. Because again, we want to create meaningful dialogue around theology, which I think is the most important thing that we could be talking about. Yes, the world is losing its mind. Yes, I'm starting another rant. Uh, the world is losing its mind, and there's all kinds of political and geopolitical things going on. But in the midst of that, still the most important thing that we can be talking about is what comes into your mind when you think about God, because that's going to determine everything else about you. So, okay, now the rant is officially over, I think. <laughs> The fundamental question in modern philosophy that has really just been a stumper and has led to this whole postmodern turn where people don't think there's no objective basis for any reality is the, is the question of the reliability of the human mind. On what basis can we trust the way our minds process all that sensory information? This goes back to, to, to Hume and Kant and some of the philosophers in the uh, Enlightenment period. Also, John Lennox does a great piece on this, and I will link a video from John Lennox who says, you know, how, if my mind is just a part of a, a unguided process, why could I trust it? If my computer was, was, was part of an unguided process, I wouldn't trust it to do any real computing. So why would I trust my mind if my mind is not designed, if my mind is just part of a random process? Enlightenment period. And from that point forward, there was a great doubt. Maybe we can't trust our minds. Maybe we can't trust uh, we have all these things we assume about reality in order to make sense about reality. That every cause has an effect, for example. Um, but we can't prove those things. We have to use those assumptions in order to know anything at all. And the, the, I encountered this argument that su suggested, well, if, if we try to justify our ability to know the, the world around us by, um, by empirical data, by things we observe, this was Hume's argument. We can't do it. Uh, if we, we, uh, he was a radical empiricist and found that in order to make any sense of the, of the sense impressions he had, he had to presuppose the uniformity of nature. But to prove the uniformity of nature, he had to make reference to s sensory observations. And so he was arguing in a circle. Anselm's epistemology is another one to look at. Um, and I'm paraphrasing and I'm probably doing a bad job of it, but belief comes before knowledge. I have to believe that this world is intelligible. I have to believe that this world, um, that the observations I'm making in this world are real and I'm not in a dream. Um, I have to believe that my mind is capable of making correct observations, that I'm not being deceived or deluded. Of course, deception is a part of this whole process and discerning truth from non-truth is part of this whole process if, of a philosophical journey and a theological journey. Um, but belief comes before knowledge. A lot of people push back on that idea, but we live as though that's true, which is what um, Stephen Meyer is talking about. And they will get to this later on in the podcast because I think under that whole belief uh, before knowledge idea is the whole idea of faith and what is faith and do I need to have faith? And, and I think some people, again, push, push against the idea that we need to have faith. And so it came down, you couldn't justify the reliability of assumptions we, the, the, we make in our minds by observing the world. You had to use those assumptions to make sense of the observations. But if you presupposed that our minds were made by a benevolent creator who gave us those assumptions in order to make sense of the world that he also made, then there was a principle of correspondence between the way the mind worked and the way the world worked, in which case we could trust the, the basic reliability of the mind. And this turns out to be one of the key foundational assumptions that gave rise to modern science. It was called the idea of intelligibility. Newton, Boyle, Kepler, the great founders of modern science, thought that, they, that nature had secrets to reveal. There were patterns there to be revealed that we could understand because our minds had been made in the image of the same rational creator who had built rationality and design and pattern and lawful order into the world. You know, I'm, I'm looking at Joe's face and you can tell, he, I, like he's interested in this. This is interesting to him. I, I think it's interesting to a lot of people. Um, again, I, I wonder where this podcast goes. Uh, what is the impact of, of this? Because um, again, I think there's a lot of people who are curious about this and the audience that, that listens to Joe Rogan 
has probably never heard these types of arguments before. I say arguments, but really these ideas that, that intelligent people have actually worked this stuff out and come to the conclusion that there's a God, like that you can be an intelligent person and believe that there's a God. You don't have to be duped into some, you know, religion or ideology. It would be really interesting to see where the effect that this podcast has on kind of the, I don't know, zeitgeist, the, uh, the <laughs> where people are today. Do you believe in evolution? I believe in uh, well. That, that's a. I believe in micro evolution. I believe that there are real evolutionary processes. I'm skeptical about what's called universal common descent. The idea that all living forms have evolved from one single common ancestor. I'm profoundly skeptical. Uh, skeptical about ch chemical evolution. The idea that the um, non-living chemicals in a prebiotic ocean or prebiotic soup arranged themselves to form the first living cell. And that is another powerful. Um, it, you can think about it in the positive, like, okay, is that a, um, is that a argument for theism? Okay, maybe it is. A and it might be even a strong argument for theism. But I think more than that, it's a very powerful argument against atheism and against the evolution of, in, in that sense of, um, macro evolution that evolution somehow explains the origin of life it just doesn't have the power to explain how a non-living thing became a living thing there's and again that kind of goes back to dna and the uh, information the code the language that's that's there and i'm also skeptical about the creative power of the mutation selection mechanism which as it happens uh so are many leading evolutionary biologists today i attended a conference in 2016, at the Royal, convened by the Royal Society uh, in London, uh, Royal Society being the oldest and most august scientific body in the world. And it was con convened by a group of evolutionary biologists who were essentially dissatisfied with neo-Darwinism, the standard textbook theory that we learn in, um, in all high school and college textbooks. And, and yet there's, it's still in the high school and college textbooks. You know, that's, that's an unfortunate thing is even the leading, you know, a lot of people have seen the light that, that, the, the sort of model of evolution that we have been perpetuating in modern secular society is, is falling apart under the weight of what we see in the world. It's just not strong enough to bear the weight of reality. And it should be said that the kind of modern secular and evolutionary ideas are really new. They're really young. With, within the scope of human existence, these are, these are really new ideas. And they don't seem to have the ability to endure the test of time. The way I think about it is adaptation. All, all animals adapt. All animals have the ability to adapt and change within their species. Evolution doesn't happen the way we're taught that it happens. Um, you can't take adaptation within one species and then expand that out to a complete theory of the origin of all species. Dis despite the fact that leading evolutionary bi biologists are seeing that the kind of Darwinian model of evolution is not strong enough to really explain what we see in reality, which a lot of that is the language and the code that we see in DNA. The reason that that still is perpetuated within the school textbooks is that there are people who have ulterior motives for perpetuating that origin story of humanity. If we can convince people that they came from primitive beasts, then we can treat them like primitive beasts and they won't know to resist that. They won't know anything else. And the, the other origin, the other, the alternative is very like, um, threatening to some people within that ideology because the the other story is that you were made in the image of God, that you have the spark of God in you, that you were made for a purpose, that life has meaning. And people who believe that are not so easy to control. Those people can be a powerful force for change in this world. And there are people within the power structure of this world who really don't want that origin story of humanity to be perpetuated because it's scary for them. And the crazy thing is, as I was kind of laying that out, um, 
my I was live streaming this. I'm live streaming this, and um, my live stream cut out. And so the first 45 minutes of this video that I've been recording, I mean, I've been live streaming it. I I wasn't recording it, unfortunately. Uh, got a, looks like it got lost right in the middle of making this exact point that there are forces in this world like there's a battle going on and there are forces in this world that don't want this message getting out now does that mean that they're in the wiring of my computer probably not but i just find it a little too convenient um because look at this i mean this again the bible has this from the beginning for our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against rulers and against the powers against world forces of this darkness and against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. World forces and spiritual forces. So the, the spiritual battle that's going on is happening in the world and happening in the, in the spiritual realm. I, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't make a, uh, I don't, I, um, I don't really make a duality there between the spiritual world and the material world. It's all part of the world that God created. And the, the sort of battle that's going on is in the mind. Like there's, there's a whole battlefield of the mind that, that, that people have, again, an ulterior motive. They really want to convince people um, that God doesn't exist, that you evolved from primitive life forms because that benefits them. Uh, that's, the, that's the truth. And so, yeah, these worldly forces, the spiritual forces, the battlefield of the mind happening in the realm of ideas and I would say the most powerful idea is the idea of God. Um, because again, that's going to inform everything else about us. Well, today was an interesting one. I had a few hiccups recording this, but I think we got the point out that the most important thing that can come into our minds is the idea of God. That's powerful. That's a powerful idea, but it's also up against other powerful ideas out in the world. And I think there are some, there, there is a spiritual battle going on. I mean, that's, as a Christian person who reads the Bible, I'm, I'm aware of that battle. I don't know how many other people are. And so, yeah, my encouragement to you is just to be, be praying. Pray for this podcast because weird stuff like that <laughs> happens sometimes. And so I do think that if, if, if in your mind you have that very powerful idea that you were created in the image of God, not because you want to have that idea, but because that idea is true. That idea is the actual truth that lines up with reality. That is a powerful idea, and you can be a powerful force for good in this world. Some people don't like that idea. They're antagonistic to that idea. There are some forces in this world that are antagonistic to that idea, which is why this whole deception thing has been going on since the beginning in the Garden of Eden. Did God really say? And so thank you for being here with me. And even if you're on a journey and you're not sure where you are, thank you for being there. And if you're a praying person, uh, let's be in prayer because I do think there are a lot of lost people out there. And I hope in some small way, if this strange theology channel and community can be a part of that force for good, then uh, great. We've used our time on this earth wisely. So thank you for being a part of this. Again, if you're here at the end and you know people who need to hear this, share this with a friend and I will catch you in the next one.